my PCBs are out. <laughs> I am so excited and absolutely terrified <laughs> from JLC PCB. So let's open them up and have a look. Duh, so scary. <laughs> so they're well packaged. That's cool. Um, yeah, very well packaged. So let's open it up. Let's see what we got. There's our boards. Oh, oh, there's the wrapped in a few different layers. Okay. Oh, this is so cool. Here we have them. <laughs> wow. Those are so pretty. Look at that. That was beautiful. <laughs> Unfortunately, the next step for me is I have to plug it in and see if it works, which is <laughs> absolutely terrifying. I have no idea if this is going to work, but it looks right. All the components look like they're in the right places to me. And yeah, it looks quite pretty. So, yeah, I mean, there's nothing to it but to plug it in really and see oh it's actually really nice the little the locating studs on the back of the switch and the power supply they're little holes lovely nicely done yeah all the silt screening is really clear as well little my name and the revision of the board on it ah actually <laughs> it's, it looks great i'm really happy with it um and uh, this little switch is actually a little bit smaller than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I know I literally looked at this in the 3D models, but the switch is teeny tiny. I think it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's still, you can still switch it easy enough with your finger. It'd just be nicer if it was maybe a bit bigger, be easier to turn on and off. But yeah, that's it. And it's absolutely lovely. Even if it doesn't work, I absolutely have to keep it um, as, you know, my first ever manufactured PCB that I got done. Yeah, definitely will keep it, but um, yeah, okay. Next thing, I'm gonna plug it in and see what happens. <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying for me. <laughs> uh, I think I'm gonna do that off camera just in case I end up crying a lot. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys in a bit. Okay, we're back. I plugged it in and surprise, surprise, it didn't work uh, first time. So there was one mistake that was um, basically, yeah, I, I made a silly mistake uh, in doing something. It was because I didn't understand the tools I was using properly and it was caused a short on the board. So that was burning out uh, one of the resistors, which was then affecting how the whole thing worked. But I managed to fix that. I don't know if it'll show up well on camera, but it was basically a tiny trace here that was bridging uh, 12 volts with ground. And that was frying one of these tiny resistors, which meant the whole thing wasn't working properly. Now, even when I split the trace then to fix it, um, one of these resistors was burnt out, which meant this switching circuit didn't work properly. So it was like always on basically. But this fresh board that I had, that I properly split the trace on, the resistor hasn't burned out because I hadn't plugged it in yet. It works, Hey, <laughs> So that's it, power switch. Um, doesn't do anything obviously right now, but the power switch is good indicator that it is working. Um, I measured voltages all around the board and all the pins are sitting at the right voltages, so that's all good. I'm fairly confident this works now with the whole switching circuit and everything, so I'm pretty happy with that. Now, <laughs> I went to wire this guy up um, to test it out fully with pop the Arduino in and pop the uh, driver uh, in and everything, <laughs> and I realized other mistakes. So this is the stepper driver. It doesn't fit. <laughs> so obviously there's meant to be female headers on here, but still it doesn't fit. Um, so I assumed that the Arduino board was the same width as the driver board. Turns out it's not. I had no reason to assume that. I physically had these. I could look at them and I just assumed. <laughs> but it doesn't fit. So 
that's one thing. Um, so I could, you know, bend some pins and stuff and make this fit. But the other problem as well is that it's also mirrored. <laughs> so I mirrored the connections on this. And the reason I did that is because if you look at these um, stepper drivers, they're so cluttered on top, the silt screen for the pin out is on the bottom. So I'm 100% certain that when I was looking at this, I was looking at it upside down and flipped it in my head. So if you look at the pinouts there, you'll see Vmote, Vmote. <laughs> so yeah, they're upside down. So if I installed this board on the underside and also bent the pins to make it fit, it would work. <laughs> but uh, And with the split trace, it would work. But yeah, um, it doesn't right now in its normal state. So. I wasn't going to get this remade just yet with the trace just because I could very easily fix it and it would work. But I decided with the traces and with the board layout being a bit messy, I'd refix, I'd fix up those things. I also wanted to add a few other little bits of notation onto this board to make it clearer, including the stepper and um, pin uh, notation, the stepper pin the phase notations for the stepper pins here and also the power supply notation for which pin of the sensor port is five volts so yeah that's been done now and i've sent that off to get manufactured so i'm not going to be able to quite test this just yet in its real form but i will be able to soon um so the next thing i'm going to do anyway before i get those actual boards shipped it'll probably take you know a week or two weeks for me to get those so until then I can't really test it fully, but what I can do is I'm happy, confident enough that this works and that my understanding was all correct in all the things I did up to now. So I'm going to show you the whole design process that I went through to get this far and things about picking components, placing components, all that sort of stuff, and then my manufacturer. Um, yeah, so I'll go through all that next and you guys can watch. In the meantime, uh, it lights. All right, uh, we're going to go have a look at that then. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about designing this PCB, the schematics that went into it, how the layout process works for the actual PCB itself, um, and just using these tools to do the whole thing. So first off, this is Autodesk Fusion 360. Um, I'm using it on its free to use non-commercial license. Now, the tools that we're actually going to be using here are effectively its Autodesk Eagle, um, which is uh, it's a tool that's been around for a very long time for doing you know uh, circuit design and simulations and PCB layout and stuff like that. But with uh, Fusion 360 being Autodesk's kind of all-in-one offering, they've rolled most of Eagle's functionality into it, and it's just called like the electronics section of Fusion 360. Um, so it's basically the same as Eagle. You can take most of what I'm doing here and apply it to using Eagle. Um, the things though that are a little bit different with uh, Fusion 360, we can integrate directly with the 3D modeling the power that Fusion 360 is so good for. And you can generate these really nice um, uh, 3D renders of your board that are native models in uh, Fusion 360. So you can then take that model and add it to some other thing you're doing. So if you want to design your case for this PCB and enclosure for this PCB in Fusion, you can then import this model directly into it and it'll all sit together and look quite nice. So that's just one of the kind of key differences there. Um, all right, but let's jump straight in and have a look at the first part. So when you create a new electronics project in Fusion, effectively, it creates this whole thing. So you start off with a schematic. From the schematic, you push it to like a PCB layout. And then from the PCB layout, you push it to the 3D render. And that's then this is just sort of the overview of all the things put together in one place. And it sort of tracks the versions of all of them together. So it's kind of just like a, a container. So we'll start from the start and we'll have a look at the schematic. Um, so this is, it looks a bit, a little bit confusing and it is a little bit confusing some of the tools work it's not super clear i think a big thing with this and a lot of other of these uh, eda softwares is that they're quite old in terms of like they've been around for a very long time and they kind of grew organically so there's not a lot of modern ux and stuff like that in them but the thing is for being so old and clunky you could say they're extremely powerful and they work really really well at uh, what they do so 
With all that said, this is my circuit, um, and I could just highlight a few key points to it. Um, first of all, this whole thing here uh, is, it's probably the most complicated part of the board, but it also is really doing <laughs> very little. It's just a switching circuit. So I'm gonna talk about this in more detail because to make sure that this switching circuit worked properly, I actually built another schematic and I'll just go into that in briefly in a second. Um, but effectively all it is is there's a power jack here so this is like a 12 volt input it goes through some switching stuff then on the far side the 12 volts goes into a 5 volt regulator which just steps the 12 volts down to 5 volts there's a little power uh, indicator led here so that when the power is turned on that uh, just um, lights up and then the guts of what the board does here then is pretty much just plumbing between all these ports. So this set of uh, ports here represents the Arduino Nano and this set of ports here represents the DRV8825 stepper driver. Um, then we've got a socket here for the motor to plug into and a socket here for the sensor to plug into. And that's pretty much it. So in terms of this whole section, basically all you're doing in the schematic is just joining pins together to wire them up. Um, in this case, what these are, are just like header pin components, because that's what I decided it was just going to be. You just pop the header pin down and that's it. Um, so the pins aren't named, um, which means that when you're laying out this kind of thing, you just have to be careful to count the right numbers of pins and make sure that they lay out properly. Um, that got me, caught me out, um, because you'll see when we go to actually pop this onto the board, um, it comes in as two separate components that can be oriented whatever way you want. And I managed to flip them because they weren't stuck together in uh, the right orientation or in the in a common orientation that would make them work. Um, so that's a little bit annoying, but there are ways around that. I just kind of hackily threw this together to make, you know, I'll just female header pins, I'll do, it's fine. Um, okay, what else is on here then? So I suppose I should say there's things to do with like the notation of things on this, um, which can be a little bit confusing. So components, well, actually, okay. So let's roll back a little bit and talk about components. Um, so one of the single kind of most difficult things about um, laying out boards and designing the circuits and stuff is the components. Um, now, these tools are kind of open source and there's a lot of people contribute, you know, components and stuff to it. But in the real world, if you're using, you know, this kind of stuff, you would basically build up your own set of components and you'd make sure that they match all of the electrical characteristics you want. You'd make sure that they have the right part numbers. You'd make sure they have the right footprints and stuff like that. The footprints will come to you in a second. But for the hobby use, one of the more difficult things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to try and build up all your components. So you see here, this is, if I go to the design manager and I go to place components, we've got a whole load of components all listed out here. And a lot of them are very similar. <laughs> a lot of them have like, you know, you've got these uh, voltage supply things. You know, they're, they're both just called V plus, but they come from different libraries. So which one should I use? And why should I use them? Why are they different? You know, this kind of thing is something that I notice is quite confusing. And even if you just try and search for something like resistor, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so which one should you use? Um, and the other thing as well is that when you start like placing the components, you'll start to see things like, well, okay, this one has a different footprint uh, or whatnot. So then what you have to consider is, okay, so I place that component as a certain footprint, but then what chip actually fits onto the board that matches that? And can my supplier who I'm going to deal with, can they actually supply that chip that you want? So then you need to go back and look at your components again and see, do they match up? And it's just, there's a lot of kind of back and forth in that where it's not super clear exactly what you have to do. So you can use some of these built-in libraries. They Some of them just will work straight away and that's fine. But what you're probably better off doing is pretty much making your own library. Um, so part of this is another slight difference then as well with between Fusion 360 and between Eagle. But Fusion 360 lets you build your own library from scratch. So there's this little button in here where you've got like this library manager thing. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes with this. And you see there's like 
Eagle PCB is the built-in ones and there's a whole load of other ones that all come with it and you can add loads more you can download library files and import them and all this sort of stuff but again another part of doing that is you're just trusting that the person built it correctly it might not be right at all the pins might be laid out wrong or the pads might be the wrong size and shape so it's kind of difficult to know and um, you have to put a lot of trust in um in the people who made them basically that they made them right um so one thing you can do is within this whole interface is you can create your own library um which i have done so i have this parts library that i created uh, and in here this just has all of the parts that i'm interested in for the board that i'm working on and um, there's a few in here that i'm not using but i'm using most of these and um, so if i click on any one of these you'll see i get like the little symbol comes up here and if i double click on them yeah so i should get pretty much all the information about them so you can see here i've got the symbol comes up i've got the footprint here and if this one has a 3d model i'll get the 3d model coming up let's try and find one that does see this guy i don't know why the 3d models aren't rendering because these all do have 3d models associated with them like the, oh yeah so there's a 3d model there um Oh, I've just opened the 3D model for it, but actually this is a good example. As you can see, this is just a native uh, Fusion 360 um, Fusion 360 3D model, and there's a little capacitor <laughs> laid out. So that'll so what will end up on your board when you go and generate your 3D model. Um, so yeah, this is one thing I would recommend, is that if you're building a project like this from scratch, you really look at the components you want to use. So I'd go to your supplier or whoever, try and figure out do they have components that they use. So for my example, I use JLC PCB. They have a really good library of all of the components that they stock and that they can assemble onto your board. And so from there, you can try and find the components that are spec the way you want them to. And then with that, you can start adding them to your library. So you can go in, you can like create your new component. You, know, you can give it a name and then you can do footprints and stuff for the footprints there's some common ones as in like so there's chip sizes say so if you're going like an 0402 resistor chip is a very specific package size which is one of the surface mounts um so you can pretty much use any resistor footprint that you could find that matches an 0402 you can associate it with this part and then that should be fine for the assembly on the board um you do have to be careful with that though because you'll get some packages that are done slightly wrong or you can get misassociated mis packages again this is part of the open source problem um if you're savvy enough you can draw these yourself um which i think you can do if i was to say go into this is the footprint if i go in yeah so this is like an inter a cad interface where if you know what you're doing you can draw these out yourself um they're it's a little bit clumsy it's not as not as slick an interface as we would be used to if you're used to normal kind of CAD. It's it's old, you know, and it's been around for a long time. But, you know, this is there's a good friend of mine who helped me along the way with this whole electronics part of this project. And he says that the way he does it is he just draws these himself. Um, he knows what he's doing and obviously he's been doing it for a long time and he's using fancier tools than this. So it all works out well for him. Um, but if you are a beginner, a good place you can go to get these is a website called snap eda i'll throw a link in the description because it's quite useful and basically they provide free downloads of footprints symbols and uh, 3d model files that you can then import here to start building up your own collection of the parts that you'd like to use so what else should i talk about oh yeah so another thing with this that's useful to know um these are all actual part numbers um, and these actual part numbers, they do matter. Uh, so some of them, like this resistor here, uh, within this part number is baked in what the actual value of that resistor is. Now, you might think, and this is what I kind of thought was, well, if I just stick a generic resistor onto the board and I tell it, I say what the package size is, then my supplier should just be able to go, okay, yeah, just stick a resistor and that, that matches that value. But in reality, that's not really how it works because, you know, they have specific resistors that have specific tolerances and all sorts of things from different manufacturers. And they need you to tell them which exact resistor you want to use. Now, 
99% of the time, it's just going to be one simple basic one. And if you look on their supply page for JLC PCB, you'll see there's one 10K resistor that they have like, you know, 50 million in stock of. So you're like, okay, that's the most common resistor. I'm guessing I can just use that one for this case. And most of the time you'll be right unless you need specific tolerances. So the part number matters. You can find the part number and then you create your part with that part number. You associate the right footprint with it. And you can add a 3D model if you want, because, you know, that'll just make things look cool when you go to render it on your board. Um, but the other thing that you can do for JLC PCB, this is important, is they have their own internal part numbers. Um, so in their attributes section, you can see this uh, LCSC part. That's basically the JLC part number. So it's important to try and include those for every part in your library if you're going with JLC PCB, because it does make it easier for them on their side, um, they'll be able to, when you upload your bill of materials file that has all the parts listed out in it, they'll be able to associate the parts much easier if you provide those part numbers. It's not essential, but I was paranoid about doing this that I'd get the wrong parts. So I was very deliberate about mapping all my parts correctly with the right part numbers. Okay, so what else? We talked about parts. Um, what else do we have to talk about? There's, there's so much in this. I feel like I could just ramble on for ages about figuring out all this stuff. But basically, once you have your circuit drawn, um, you're going to want to put it onto the board. So from within here, you've got this button up here, which goes switch to PCB document. So that will dump you into, when it loads, this guy. So. This is our actual layout tool for the PCB itself. So when you first populate this, this is, space will be completely empty and all your components will be off to the side here. So what you have to do is you have to basically drag and drop every component onto the board. And when you do that, you'll end up with this crazy mesh of wires everywhere. So all of these you know, connectors that go between all the components are ones that I've drawn. It won't be like that when you first drop all your components. You just have these crazy wires going everywhere. They're called air wires. Um, and that will be the template to show you where all the connections are. And then what you have to do is you have to click and like drag basically those air wires to create these actual traces. Um, I'm not going to get into a huge amount of detail about this because, again, this is another topic that you could, you could talk about for hours. And I'm no expert in this at all either. So I posted on Reddit recently when I got these boards delivered and I got so much feedback about, you know, great feedback on things that I had done wrong or things that I had done suboptimally. Uh, and I had the help of, of a professional who does this every day, helping me out with figuring out this layout and stuff like that. And even then there's only so much he could tell me because you have to do this and learn and figure it out and break stuff and all sorts. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to know about this. This is people's literal jobs as being an expert in laying out these kinds of boards. Um, but this is what you'll end up with. Um, a few highline things. Uh, if you have power on your board, so these uh, big ones, VS and VD, are power traces. So this is uh, basically 12 volts coming from my power supply, goes down into my switching circuit, and then goes out towards my motor. These carry quite a bit of current, as in they carry most of the current of the whole thing. So you'll notice these traces are quite thick. Um, they're about a millimeter thick. And then you notice the other traces are a lot smaller. So there's some down here that carry five volts for a few other things. They're a good bit smaller. Um, they won't carry a huge amount of current because they're just powering one LED and some um, uh, digital uh, supply stuff in here. So there'll be very little current to draw on them. So the trace is a little thinner. And again, over here, these are the motor lines. They're quite thick as well, because again, this is the current that the motor is gonna draw is relatively high. Again, this is a this is all a low, relatively low current setup anyway, so there's not going to be huge current flowing through this, but proportionally, those are going to have the highest current going through them. So, yeah, I don't really want to get into any more detail on this because I feel like I'll just ramble, and I'll probably be saying things that aren't entirely accurate anyway, um, because I don't know a huge amount about this uh, in general. But one thing I will say is the tooling up here for like this quick route section can help you out at the start. It will kind of, you can auto route. So you can click a button that'll just automatically do all this routing. It is recommended that you don't do that. <laughs> it's recommended that you do it kind of manually. Um, 
because the auto router can just make mistakes and stuff like that so you wouldn't necessarily want to trust it but one thing that definitely you should use that was only i was only told about uh, after the fact when i messed something up is if you go up to here rules uh d or c slash e or c so d or c is a design rule checker it's basically like a spell check for this whole thing so it's built with some smart defaults that will detect issues like it'll detect if traces are too close together and that sort of stuff or if you've got bridged some traces that you shouldn't have bridged click this button it'll do this check across your whole board and it'll tell you if you've messed anything up it'll tell you if there's anything you haven't routed so if you have any stray wires things like that so it's very very good there's no reason not to use it <laughs> just literally click the button and it'll give you some outputs so definitely use it um that'll probably save you some pain it would have saved me some pain on the previous version of a board that um had a had a short across it here so i previously had a short that was running across here the design rule check would have told me that if i had run it but to be honest i didn't even know what that thing meant so i didn't even know that i should run it um but yeah that's that's a definite thing you should know about and you should use it <sighs> okay so with all this said so far we've so we've designed our schematic we've laid out our board we're happy with it we can click this button push to 3d pcb and that will dump us here which is pretty cool so this is the entire board populated with all of the components all laid out uh, the way that we have it drawn so this is where what i mentioned about in the library here if you have your little um 3d models associated with all your parts then when you go to generate this they'll be automatically populated and yeah they'll just look really cool <laughs> so i mean it's not really an essential thing it does look cool and it's nice to look at the board physically and see oh that's that looks a bit tight there or i don't really like that um for you know human interface uh, design as well so this switch i have on the board now this actually caught me out because it wasn't until i physically got the board that i realized that this switch is actually tiny i have to use my nail to flick it on and off which it's not really a huge issue it's kind of fine it still works but from this perspective it was actually easy enough to see say comparison to the size of the barrel jack which i know what that barrel jack size is i should have been able to see that that's way too tiny um but perspective is kind of difficult um so the other thing as well is like these chips are minuscule they're like absolutely the the, the tiniest little chips i've ever seen and this kind of doesn't give you that impression necessarily so even though it's a good tool and I would say look at it and focus on it if you want to you know get that sort of impression but it's kind of hard to tell until it's actually in your hands or you've designed it and then you've looked at it and then you've looked at the real thing and gone right okay that's <laughs> that's that's going to be too small for this purpose so that's for the switch here um I mean 90% of the time it doesn't really matter but you know it's just something that this can be useful for other than that it's just nice to have the little bit of artwork and just play around with it and just <laughs> enjoy uh you know what you've made here <laughs> um okay so one last thing i want to cover just before uh, i go before i leave this is the switching circuit so that's this whole business here um and I want to talk about it just in a small bit of detail because it's kind of an interesting sort of electrical design. Um, and also uh, I can talk about the simulation setup that you can do within Eagle, which is really powerful as well. Um, so first of all, I could just talk about why we want to do this. So we have a little switch and we have a 12 volt power supply. And all of that effectively is powering the motor. Now, the thing with the motor is the motor will draw a certain amount of current. Um, it's a relatively high amount of current for a lot of, you know, digital applications. Like most of the time when you're just dealing with microcontrollers and a few LEDs and stuff like that, you're drawing minuscule amounts of current. As soon as you put a motor into that system, the current like really ramps up exponentially. And the amount of current that is drawn by a motor, even a small stepper motor, you know, can be one to probably 1.5 amps. Uh, that's quite a lot of current um, compared to other things like your microcontrollers, which are which are drawing like, you know, milliamps and microamps and that kind of thing. So things can burn out easily enough when you put one amp through them uh, if they're not made for that. So that's a thing you also need to make sure when you're specking out all of your parts. So you spec out your port here. Does this, can this barrel jack handle one or two amps? 
you know, you have to look at that when you're picking the part. Can this capacitor, well, actually the capacitor is not really going to matter too much here, but all of your switching circuit down here as well, you need to make sure that they can all handle that amount of current. So with all that said, why do I need this switching circuit? And the answer is, it's kind of a bit nuanced, but basically when you think about what a switch is, what the switch is doing here, if you just connected this 12 volts directly through the switch and then the output of the switch directly out to the motor controller, all of the current when it's drawing it's, you know, one or 1.5 amps is flowing through this little switch. Now there are little switches that are designed that can handle high amounts of current, but the majority of them actually aren't designed to handle that much current at all. The idea of them is that they actually just draw, have tiny amounts of current flowing through them and all they're doing is just switching uh, a voltage reference. So in this case I have it switching, the switch goes between 12 volts on one side and ground on the other side, but there's a tiny amount of current flowing through it. And you'll notice this tiny little switch, if you look at the data sheet for it, it's only specced for a few milliamps. And that's all. That's a perfectly fine in this use case because I'm not pulling all of the motor's current through it. Now, if I found a switch that worked well at higher amps, you could do that. But again, it's, it's not really great practice to have a little slide switch actually interrupting, uh, you know, high current flow. Um, because, you know, you have sliding contacts and stuff like that. You can get things like sparking or whatever if you have, you know, high voltages, high currents and that sort of stuff. So generally not a great practice. Um, so that brings me to why I have this switching circuit, which I can get into. I won't get into it in massive detail, but essentially the overview of it is this uses a MOSFET and a BJT to set up a switching circuit whereby we've got our 12 volts here and it sort of goes down to the MOSFET there's a line breaks off the 12 volts down here to the uh, switch. When you switch the switch, uh, some of that uh, current and basically the 12 volts goes down, turns on this BJT. The BJT in turn turns on the MOSFET. Then the MOSFET conducts from one end to the other end and that goes through and powers the whole circuit. So. It's, I'm not getting into the, the nitty gritty of how that works, but effectively you've got these resistors and capacitors set up with these two um, switching uh, transistors. And that whole thing means that the switch itself doesn't actually handle any current. It just flicks on, just flicks between two voltage references and the uh, transistors here handle all that current. They're rated to be able to handle that current. And so the current can, can flow through these chips to your motor driver and power your motor. So you might think, well, that all sounds quite complicated. So how do you design something like that? And I have it here in my schematic, but like this just looks like it's just a bunch of components thrown together. I have values in here, you know, two 10K resistors here, 20K resistor here, some 100 <laughs> micro ohm capacitors here. This is a transistor. Yeah, it's a transistor. <laughs> and so is this one. But, you know, there's nothing about this tells me, does this work or not? So what you can do is you can, within Eagle and within most of these EDA softwares, you can do simulations using something called SPICE. So SPICE is extremely old technology, been around for a very long time, and it's basically computer simulations of electronic circuits. Um, so we can do a SPICE simulation for this. Now, this whole system, this, so there's kind of sort of two classes of schematics you can be creating. Now, sometimes people will make them work in both ways, but in this case, I haven't. The first class is one that's just for the layout. So this basically is what this is. None of this stuff is configured to be simulated directly, but effectively it will let me lay out my board the way I want it to. But I needed this part to be simulated because I knew the rest of this was going to work because it's basically just plumbing, just connecting wires together. But the part that I didn't necessarily know if it would work was this whole switching circuit. So what I did was I built another circuit here and this is the switching circuit just on its own, but it's been built out with specifically selected components that are set up for um, set up for simulation. So if you go into your libraries, you can search ng spice and there's a built in library for it. And here we have all the components. So 
these are basically all the simple building blocks of electronics. So you've got resistors, you've got uh, power supplies, you've got inductors, you've got capacitors, you have diodes, all sorts of other things in here. And the entire idea with this is that these are all set up that you can drop them into your schematic, connect them all up properly, and then you can run simulations to simulate what will happen in certain cases. So this circuit I have set up to basically simulate a switch switching on and off constantly. And I have these probes set up to give me the, uh, the outputs from that. So if I click the simulate button, I can ignore this for a bit, but here I get a simulation output and this shows me basically what will happen when I switch my switch on and off and it'll show me the voltages and currents and stuff that are running through the system. So again, I don't want to get into huge detail on this because again, this could be its whole own video in its own right. But this is just giving you the idea that I didn't just throw all this together and know it would work. What I had to do was I had to build out this circuit. I had to test it out. I had to play with these you know, values for all the components to make sure it would actually work. You know, along the way, I did. I figured out that you know some of the component values weren't going to be right, and I had to change them. But ultimately, from doing this simulation, I was fairly certain that this switching circuit would actually work before I laid it out uh, on my board. Now, I can't take full credit for this. Um, my very good friend Keith, who I've been talking about throughout this video, who's a professional at this stuff, he helped me design the circuit. Uh, but ultimately, choosing all the capacitor values and everything was something, and the resistor values was something I had to do, and also choosing the exact uh, types of uh, transistors was something I had to do. So I had to lay it all out on the board, I had to find the right models that would work to simulate these transistors and stuff, and get it working. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid I've just gone through, barreled through so much content here, and this video has gotten so long, I apologize already. But there's just there's just a huge amount in this, and like I could keep talking about this for hours. There's so much more detail you can go into. Um, but I think for kind of a cursory overview of the whole thing, end to end, the whole process, uh, this is about the best I could do. Sorry if it was a bit disjointed. I was just running through things as they kind of occurred to me in my head. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to leave it here for this. Um, if you have any specific questions, please ask in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you. There's just so much in this, I just couldn't cover everything. Um, and also I probably glossed over some things and got other things wrong. But yeah, if there's anything confusing, drop uh, questions in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful to some of you. Um, the next thing, uh, so this is, as you might see here, this is version 3, 1.3 of the board. So I fixed some of the problems that I had, and this is now on its way to the factory to get made. So a couple of weeks time, I should have that board back, and then I'll be able to fully test it, and I'll be able to show you guys the final fully finished bit. So you might see that in the next video. Um, I don't actually know what the next video is gonna be about in terms of this project as we keep going, but anyway, there's a lot to do, so we're gonna keep moving. And I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.